21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. I've experienced a lot of the components of a family business. <clears throat> and, oh, okay. um, and because my father passed away really at a relatively young age and there were five children in the business, um, as we tried to grow, again, we experienced a lot of the sibling issues that there are with family businesses, which led me to buy out my family at their request. Um, then family business succession became a whole different thing because it was just my three children versus 10 grandchildren of my father. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to build our business and work with our children in a manner that we didn't have the same kind of experience that I had with my brothers and sisters and my mother for that uh -huh. matter. Uh, just to recap a little bit, my dad started our business with two sewing machines in a basement, uh, sewing lace around baby doll diapers in 1949. He and my mother worked very closely together um, to build the business. I grew up in the business as did my four brothers and sisters. I was the oldest. We, uh, When I graduated from college in 1968, we were doing somewhere between two and three million dollars a year in sales. For the next 10 years, my dad and I worked close to together and we grew it to about 10 million in sales. He died of lung cancer at the age of 55. So it was definitely a premature death at that point. Uh, my family actually lived in Florida, which is where my father had started a division. I lived in Ohio, which was the headquarters of the company. And certainly the, the distance between us challenged our ability to communicate really effectively and and have the kind of communications you have to have if you want to uh, have effective ownership of, of family ownership. Uh, we worked together pretty well for 10 years. And at that point, we started experiencing a lot of the problems that family businesses have, uh, which resulted in their request that I buy them out. And subsequently, I did that in 1994 and have been running the business since that time period. I'm very, uh, proud of the business we've been able to create over the years. We now do over $200 million a year in sales. We have about 400 associates that work for us. Uh, my three children don't have their careers in the business, uh, but they're active shareholders of the business and see uh, ownership of the family business as a uh, responsibility of stewardship, not one of entitlement. So we're, we've been very fortunate in that regard. actually bought the whole company from your family? I did, yes. Uh huh, okay. Because my family lived in Sarasota, they lived in Florida, and they worked in the division down there. Um, and because my brothers and sisters uh, did not complete their college education, uh, which isn't as significant as the fact that when they didn't complete it, my dad let them come into the business, Therefore, they had no other perspective on what business looked like other than what they recall as my father growing, you know, as they were growing up. And so as the business grew, it took on many different dimensions uh, that was hard for them to understand. Uh, so uh, we started polarizing. They didn't, they never questioned my role as being the president of the company. and you know, driving the strategy of the company. They just didn't see what their role was. And they wanted a role that was sort of similar to my father's, <laughs> a level of independence and all. And as I say, they didn't have other outside work experience to give them a valid perspective of what was going on in our business. In addition, um, they connected with a... Um, person who purported to be a family business consultant in Florida and worked with him for nine months before he even contacted me. And 
supported some of their emotional feelings that they had about the business. Um, and they sort of built their own personal coalition between my mother and my four brothers and sisters down there. And the train really left the station before I was asked to get on board. Um, and we couldn't get it resolved. We worked together for three years trying to try to get it resolved. They couldn't fully articulate what they wanted. Again, I think that was the result of not having a good, clear perspective from other business experience. Um, and the resolution that they all came up with was that I should just buy them out. At one point, they would have just wanted me to sell the business. And whatever we got from it, we'd split amongst everybody. And I wasn't interested in doing that. So they said, well, then buy us out. Uh, so we negotiated for uh, well over a year to try to see what was important to them. And, and basically, they wanted a stream of income that would support them for the next 20 years. And that's, that's how we were able to resolve it. Did it change your personal relationship in some way? Oh, very much so. Yes, my my mother didn't speak to me for three years. Uh, there were a lot of issues. Now, since that time, most of those have gone away. There's there's still a few issues, and as as you know, it's more than twenty five years ago. But <laughs> blood runs thick and runs long, so there's still some some issues. And I knew, you know, I knew when I bought them out that it was not. It was going to be a lose-lose for me. I mean, either I would screw the business up and wouldn't be able to support the payout that I agreed to, or, you know, the business would be very successful and they would feel that I cheated them. And I guess, fortunately, it's the latter and not the former. <laughs> um, but that's... And again, it's pretty typical of family businesses that don't make the kind of investment you have to make into the family business ownership component of a, of a multi-generational family business. And maybe some, some other conclusions now from 25 plus year of, of your experience, uh, having different personal re relationship with them. Are there any conclusions, any, you know, tipping points you can stress out? You know, it was aggravated to some degree in my situation because my brothers and sisters and my mother lived a thousand miles away. So we had a, a geographic separation, uh, which further complicated reconnecting with them on a personal basis. Audio conversations are one dimensional. Zoom communications is two-dimensional in person is three-dimensional and you can't replace three dimensions with two dimensions or one dimensions so i don't know that it would have helped that much if we had today's technology obviously you're focused on the business and you have to to get it started and get it up and running but you don't want to take too much time to not invest in the family relationship component of the business if you want other family members to be owners of the business, or if you want future descendants to be owners of the business. I'll give you an example. And, you know, much of what I did early on was more intuitive than, than really having any knowledge. Uh, but when my family lived in Florida and I lived in Ohio, I felt it was important that once a year we all got together as family. And we would have a business meeting and also have social activity. So we would go to different resorts to do this, such as Hilton Head, um, uh, some Florida resorts. But, you know, we would plan this once a year. And my brothers and sisters and I and my mother and our board of directors could interact over a two to three day time period, both business wise and social wise. And even the young cousins, my nieces and nephews, would get together at that point. Well, there was a point where my brothers and sisters and my mother said, well, we think this is costing too much money. It's not a warranted expense. So they said, don't, we don't want to do it anymore. Well, it's ironic that shortly after we stopped doing these annual get-togethers, 
that's when our business personal relationships started having problems at that point. So my point is that, you know, you invest in marketing, you invest in sales, you invest in your financial component of your business. You have to equally invest in the family ownership aspect of the business, even if your family shareholders are not involved in the business, if you want them to continue to be owners. So that needs to be recognized, I think, pretty early on. I recognized, I mean, I was doing it intuitively, not really recognizing the significance of it until we lost it. And again, after I bought them out and I started working with my family, uh, we've invested a great deal more in the family ownership aspect of the business. Can you define family ownership aspect? Uh, the family shareholder, where, ah, okay. where I uh, your I generation of family members or your, you know, your children and grandchildren. So I don't, I think Sarah told you about the book that I wrote yeah, recently. Yeah. yeah. Vibrant vision. So I have I a chapter in there on governance and on shareholder education. And you, mm. you know, those things don't happen naturally. <laughs> mm. uh, they, it takes education. It takes time to build trust. Uh, it takes um, uh, uh, the education that allows your descendants to recognize that they're not being given something that they have entitlement to to support their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They're being handed a treasure uh, that employs and supports hundreds of other families. And it's a treasure that they have a responsibility to be good stewards of. So, you know, there's a contrast between an entitlement sense of ownership and a stewardship sense of ownership. And far too many family businesses, particularly in the second and third generation, see it more as an entitlement than as a responsibility of stewardship. Regarding the entitlement versus the stewardship uh, dilemma, what did you find out uh, about ego during your your life journey? And regarding the topic we are talking about, um, I had a, a, a mentor of mine, very good friend, who was a generation older than me. On his desk, uh, he had a saying. And, and he ran a large public business. And the saying was, there is no limit to how far a man can go as long as he cares not who gets the credit. And to me, that's, that's where ego comes in, in my opinion. I think uh, ego gets in the way very quickly and very easily and in ways that are not necessarily self-recognized uh, there. So. Did you had any ego issues in your family? I had it. The subtlety of mine, I think, is I mentioned that the the um, the model that my brothers and sisters had about a family business was my father, and I think they unconsciously always wanted, in a sense, to be my father or to be able to have a life that had the, the kind of role that they perceived him to play. Now, that was an out-and-out -out ego. You know, they weren't trying to be president of the company. And they weren't really trying to show that because they were owners, they could order other people around. Um, but I do think that they uh, didn't have a good appreciation for what other people in the company were contributing. What about authenticity? How would you define authenticity? And is it important? And what about different authenticities at the same time in the same room or same yeah. space? How do well, you I deal think, with it? I think authenticity uh, comes from being will willing to be vulnerable. Uh -huh. And um, I think an important component of 
running any organization is both teamwork and trust. Mm-hmm. And you don't build trust amongst your team if you're not authentic. If they don't perceive you as being authentic, uh, you won't you won't get the trust you need to build your team. With my brothers and sisters, you know, I I tried to be authentic. Um, I'm not sure that I came across as feeling a willingness of being as vulnerable as they thought I should be. But I also think that they didn't want to feel vulnerable at all. I think that gave them a great sense of insecurity there. So, so that's probably how that played play out. If you were our psychotherapist, that's what you might say. <laughs> and I might add that in many of our family meetings, um, we had one of our board members that I put on the board specifically because he was a, a psychiatrist or psychologist, a psychologist. And he tried his best to try to try to deal with these family emotion issues and uh, found it very challenging. What is the power of emotions from your point of view? To be a good leader, you have to inspire. And to inspire your team, they have to recognize your authenticity. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. So, you know, in the face of any business challenge that we've had or challenges that we've had, it's important to communicate clearly what those challenges are. I mean, you can't sugarcoat challenges. But in the process of doing that, the emotions you communicate that are positive, that give them confidence that we can overcome these challenges, uh, really gets them on board and keeps them on board and keeps their spirits positive. Uh, If you communicate the the challenges in a doom and gloom kind of manner. And even if you say we'll get through this together one way or the other, that's not the same thing as um, giving a very positive confidence that you as a team will be able to get this accomplished. Uh, But everybody has to work together as a team to make that happen. I think, um, you know, there's a component of charisma that comes into that. And that's not necessarily natural for everybody, but I do think everybody that has risen to a position of leadership can recognize the importance. And if you're going to deliver a message, you want that message to be positive in the end. And if you have to practice the delivery so that you come across in a positive manner, then that's what you need to do. Uh, so I, I think that's I think it's critical to uh, leadership and in, in moving your organization forward. There's um, particularly if you're going to be multi generational, your your business is going to face so many changes going forward because the world's always changing and what you're providing in product and service today is probably not going to be successful, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So part of the culture of the organization has to be a culture to accept change and recognize and get people to recognize that change is an opportunity for them. They're not going to be victims of changes or victims of the change. And we've done that, I think, in incorporating that as a cultural component to our company because we continue to push ourselves to the next level. Um, That happens when you want to commit your organization to growth 
you're always going to be pushing yourself to the next level. I, I recognized that fortunately early on after my father passed away because we had worked together for 10 years. We grew our business from, you know, 2 million to 10 million, which, you know, that was pretty substantial back in the day. And when I reflected on my first 10 years in the business, what I recognized is that we would grow our business and then we would plateau. And then we'd grow our business and we would plateau. And generally when we plateaued, it was because our people weren't growing. It couldn't take us to the next level. Uh, it was only when we made some leadership changes that God is moving to the next level. I also recognize that we were not investing in our human capital. We were taking it for granted. We didn't even have a personnel manager. Now we had over 200 employees that worked for us, but we didn't have a personnel manager. So one of the first decisions I made after my father passed away was to convince our organization that we needed somebody whose full-time responsibility was to address the issues of human capital, the issues of our employees. And um, when I found this person and hired him, I didn't call him a personnel manager because I didn't want him to do what I call just the custodial things of personnel. I wanted him to be more strategic. So he was our director of human resources. And it was one of the most significant hires I made early in my career. Uh, I can say that over my time of 40 years, I only had three uh, human resource managers or VP of human resources because it was an important position. It reported to the CEO. To me, it, it's the most important um, team member you can have is your, your HR uh, leadership person at that point. But um, that's really a key part to, to growing your business in a sustainable manner. Because you, you bring the ideas in. I was tempted many times to continue to work in the business like my dad did, which was, you know, kind of his ideas and the things that he wanted. But you're only one person and you only had 24 hours a day. Your ability to grow a business is to, is to have your vision out there, stay involved enough with it, but you've got to leverage your vision and your capabilities through other people. Otherwise you're simply not going to grow. A very, important component of leadership that probably most leaders, particularly, well, men or women, probably don't recognize how important it is to accomplish that. You, you said you started doing this, you know, when you were 18. And it was um, because of my father's early death, uh, and again, if you read my book, I have, the book is called A Vibrant Vision, The Entrepreneurship of Multi-Generational Family Businesses. And the, one of the last chapters uh, has to do with balance in your life. How do you take care of yourself? And, um, you know, you recognize the need to do that in your late teens or early 20s. I didn't recognize it so much until I was in my 30s. Um, part of it comes from, interestingly enough, from challenges in our marriage and where we were using uh, a psychologist to help us uh, deal with our marriage issues, which forces you to look at yourself. Uh, the other part, I mentioned earlier that one of our board members was a psychologist and he was helping me work with my family issues with my brothers and sisters and my mother. When we were flying back from Florida to Ohio, um, I asked him, I said, Jay, you've now seen me operate as a, you know, as a leader for our company. Do you have any recommendations on what kind of development I should be doing? Jay was very involved with the Gestalt Institute in Cleveland. And his uh, recommendation to me 
was to do a men's only workshop uh, for a weekend. Um, but he said he was facilitating that workshop. And as we got closer to it, it turned out that my best friend also decided to take that workshop for the weekend. So you've had enough experience to know that you go into one of those workshops, if they're quality facilitators, you're going to have to be vulnerable. <laughs> you're going to have to open yourself up. Especially and there I was in going into gestalt, one, uh, in gestalt process. Right. <laughs> uh, fortunate, and there I was going into one with a member of my board of directors was there. <laughs> And one of my best friends was there, who we did not disclose that amongst the rest of the group till the, to the end of the three days. So in that session, I just, I learned a lot. I gained a lot from that experience. Um, and I remain connected to a lot of the Gestalt theory. Well, that was just a very uh, good week. And obviously, as you know, from those kind of experiences, forces you to do a lot of um uh, soul searching and and um uh, that force you into being vulnerable uh so you you know you get personal growth from that uh, that kept me associated with the um uh, gestalt institute in in the cleveland area and um as a matter of fact purely by coincidence not by design uh, many of the resources, outside resources we use for leadership coaching, uh, for our strategic planning process, uh, have been trained in Gestalt psychology in, in one form or the other. So <clears throat> just recognizing the human component, uh, both of yourself, uh, as well as uh, of your, your uh, you know, your team, uh, I think allows you to build a more effective team in your in your business operation. Uh, you can't ignore the psychological component of the human capital that you're trying to bring together to to build your business. The world in a tangle it's time to make a change. I'm gonna move away and change my name. I said the world in a tangle. What's going on? have the same level of output with a different organizational structure, the ownership vibes, uh, personality traits, etc. That's a easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very broad. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, again, I'll refer back to my book when I was writing yeah, sure, sure, A sure. Vibrant Vision, which... Uh, <laughs> The background behind the book is that when I retired as CEO, um, I basically was reflecting on the fact that I've always thought I might want to write a book, but I didn't really know what that would take. Uh, my motivation was to write a book uh, about the business processes we had discovered and implemented in our business that allowed us to grow uh, to $200 million a year in sales. Uh, and and remain growing as a sustainable business but as i was working with a writing consultant who did some research she said uh, you know the, the space there is where there's a void in the literature today is that there's a lot of books on how to grow a business and there's a lot of books on family businesses but there's nothing that talks about how do you grow a business uh for multi-generational business and a family business to be multi-generational so as i thought about that and we took notes and all uh, and this gets back to your question martin to some degree and the the first chapter of the book is a chapter on innovation uh that's the way our company was built i think any business that is uh going to be multi-generation has to have a culture of innovation because every generation is going to face new challenges uh and you've got to be able to adjust that there's nothing static in life and and innovation is not just about innovation of service and product it's innovation 
about processes that you're using to accomplish these type of things. It's also innovation about governance and shareholders and, and ownership. So when you think about future generations, uh, as long as you're continuing the engagement of an education process, you're able to take the core values of the business and the founders of the business and present them to the next generations. But at the same time, you learn and understand what the world of the next generation is. Uh -huh. And you find a way to, again, innovate that allows them to exercise their leadership uh, for the opportunities and challenges that their generation is going to face. Uh, I think the worst thing is to tell the next generation that, well, this is the way I did it. And so this is the way you should do it. Um, you, you know, you exactly. just, you can't do that. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, any organization is a human being. It's a human organism exactly. uh, that survives with human capital. So, you know, the kind of issues you have in a business or the kinds of issues you have in relationships, they may not be that recogni recognizable, but they certainly go a lot. Uh, so you have to deal with all of them. And if you don't, uh, it'll be hard to be successful over generations. Yeah, sure. You learn and understand what the world of the next generation is. And you find a way to innovate that allows them to exercise their leadership. Can you tell us something about, about you today? Did you find your own peace? Are you a happy person? I'm, I'm a very happy person. I, I think one of my most challenging decisions to make was to step aside, retire as CEO and step aside. And I told my, um, my entire management team and our employees that, you know, I, if I had my druthers, I'd like to die in the saddle with my boots on. <laughs> but... Uh, I'd be doing a great disservice to them, a great disservice to our customers, and a great disservice to my family if I did that. Uh, you have to have an ability to transition the leaders at some point. So uh, fortunately, I had many other things to do. And um, as an example, um, I hired my son-in-law to work for me to look for new investment opportunities, not where I would be a hands-on manager or hands-on leader, but to be able to make investments in, in, um, in businesses where we could apply the things we learned in growing our business and grow more businesses, help, help continue to create value and create uh, career opportunities for human capital, if you will. The one thing we did locally, because uh, I decided to start playing tennis again after I uh, retired, our, our local indoor tennis facility as i say we're near cleveland so you know what our weather can be like uh had been there for 40 years and they decided to close down uh, right after i started playing tennis as i tell everybody i thought my game was better than that but they they decided to close down anyway so uh a couple years later we decided to make an investment in a tennis facility and my son-in-law is an avid tennis player uh, who actually is from romania uh, uh -huh. But um, he, uh, he we, we built a new indoor tennis facility, was rated Beautiful. as the best new tennis facility by the USTA in the country. Beautiful. So that, you know, that gives me something fun to do. It's good exercise. We're creating another business. It's great for the community. So those are the kind of things that I do. I, I probably am more frustrated today because of COVID and mm. having to create this bubble and you can't get out and you can't travel um and i recognize that's a lot of the ways a lot of people retire but that's not for me <laughs> my greatest frustration is right now dealing with the covid but my hope is that you know we have a vaccine here in a few months and we can oh, get life will, back to normal come. i'm happy and plus i continue to you know play a role in our family business we have a family council my uh, one daughter heads that up. We're providing education and interaction with our grandchildren. 
So um, I am fortunate, very fortunate to be able to retire, but still get connected and be able to be involved in, in ways in which I can pace myself to do that. Uh, you have to be very deliberate about not interfering. And that's, you know, that's sometimes hard to do. And you have to be proactive about that. It's not natural. It's not natural uh, to be able interfere. to to not interfere and it's it's not natural for you know for the ceo that's leaving the founder ceo so to speak uh but it's not natural for the organization either because all they've got to do is see you're around and they think you're really pulling the strings so you have to be very proactive um, to be sure you're not undercutting your new leadership team and uh you also have to position yourself so you're seen as a resource and not somebody that's second guessing the new leadership team. We say shirts, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Uh -huh. I've always heard rice patties to rice patties in three generations. There's a number of different metaphors for that. And um, I think that's because as the third generation is growing up, you're farther removed from the challenges of building a business uh -huh. and understanding what really has to go into it and you begin to see it more as an entitlement and in a lifestyle type of, of business and i think that's where very proactive shareholder education family shareholder education has to has to be done you know it doesn't happen in the first generation very often because i don't think your first generation people really have the time to think about it. I mean, they're trying to build the business, put the foundation on. It definitely should happen in the second generation. You've got to get it started there at that point. Um, and you've got to preserve the, the history of the company and the culture and the uh, uh, values of that, of that foundation and pass that on effectively. And so if the third generation can understand that they have inherited a treasure that they are stewards of and their primary responsibility is to turn it over to the fourth generation in better condition that they received it. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take to do that? You know, you, you, you've got to have a good outside board of directors that will select the best leadership, whether they're family or non-family is there. And you have to have good shareholder education. And I think, you know, this is what my book tries to do. You know, I, I talk about how to grow the business. Uh, and this is where I've been truly fortunate in my journey because I've been able to recognize, be a part of, learn and be a part of, of these different things. But you have to have innovation. You have to have human capital because it's going to be other people who are going to help you make it done, done or help you leverage yourself. You have to have good strategic planning so, so that you're constantly thinking of the challenges that are in front of you and how do you have to adjust to do that? You have to have constant reinvestment. You've got to, you know, you can't take all your capital out of the business that you're generating. You've got to reinvest for change, whether that's technology, equipment, plant and property, or your human capital. You've got to invest in those. Then you have to have good governance. You've got to have governance that will force the CEO of the company who may be the founder or a second generation to question themselves, to be vulnerable to themselves. So you have to have independent board members that aren't afraid to challenge you. If they're just going to rubber stamp you, you don't need them. And then you have to have shareholder education. And then with all of that, and this is that chapter I was talking about, how do you get balance in your life? How do you, how do you end your journey feeling happy, feeling at peace, feeling sad, feeling that you've done all you can do? and have confidence that your future generations are going to take this treasure and, and manage it effectively and continue to pass it on. Entrepreneurship models that we talk about in the United States, in North America, are the models where as soon as you have an idea and you put a business plan together, you have to have an exit strategy. Uh, this is so you can go on Shark Tank and you know get money. Well, the decisions you make about building a business that has an exit strategy um, are significantly different 
than the decisions you'll make if you think you want to be multi-generational. And I believe that the strategic decisions you make within the context of being multi-generational will have you be more successful in the long run because they're going to be long-term related decisions and not short-term related decisions. There'll be decisions that will, by their very nature, have you make long-term investments and maybe even more investments in your business than if you're thinking about either an exit strategy or a lifestyle business or trying to extract the highest level of profitability that you can out of the business right now. So I would encourage, I'm, I would, I'm not saying don't have an exit strategy kind of model or go on Shark Tank because that drives a lot of innovation. There's no question about that. But let, look, let's look at the other model also, because once you get your business started in a few foundation blocks and you start making other decisions, those foundation blocks that are laid to be multi-generational will be better long-term decisions for your business than if you just try to make it to have an exit, exit strategy. Thank you, Richard, for sharing with us uh, so much wisdom. I will not say just know-how, but wisdom, uh, lifelong experience. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for listening to the 21st Century Entrepreneurship Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into Richard's personal and business experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others and leave a rating and review. I'm wishing you the very best in what lies ahead. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik.